I'm Dr. Ann Peters from the University of Southern California, and today I'm talking with Dr. Juan Frias about terzepatide. So welcome. And first, just start off, you've used terzepatide a lot more than I have because I've just been using it since it's been on the market, but tell me what's your sense of it. Do you like it as a drug for treating people with type 2 diabetes? And then what about your thoughts about using it for treating weight loss? Yeah, well, and it's a pleasure to be here with you. And um, we have been using terzepatide in the clinical trials now for, gosh, it's been about eight years in the phase two clinical trials, and we were involved in four of the five phase three clinical studies. And these were open label studies, so we knew who was receiving terzepatide and who was receiving either placebo or the active comparators in the trials we were in that was either insulin degladec or ozempic or semaglutide one milligram. And I think based on the data and certainly based on my clinical experience in the trials and then subsequent to that, um, you know, an excellent medication. I think as with the GLP-1 receptor agonist, but a medication that gets a lot of our patients to their glycemic targets, gets there with weight loss as opposed to weight gain. If used in combination with medications that don't cause hypoglycemia, there's no increased risk of hypoglycemia. And a safety and tolerability profile that's very comparable to what we see with the GLP-1 receptor agonist that many of us are, are used to. And the data actually shows improvements at the three doses that were studied, 5, 10, and 15 milligrams, compared to either placebo or the active comparators that it was compared to, which included um, semaglutide 1 milligram as well as titrated insulin degladec. We've also been involved in the, um, the surmount program, which is the, the weight loss program. We saw data, as, as you've seen, at the ADA from surmount 1, which was a study in people without type 2 diabetes that had either overweight or obesity, and really unsurpassed weight reduction in that study, Not, nothing that we really had seen before with as many of our recall correctly, up to 36% of the patients losing greater than or equal to 25% weight loss, and over 90% having greater than 5% weight loss, which is where you start getting a, a clinical benefit from the weight reduction. So I think it'll be interesting to see. There was recently a press release that came out showing that the FDA had granted Eli Lilly fast track approval status or regulatory review for terzepatide for, for obesity, but the studies are still ongoing, so I think it remains to be seen. In your brain, do you think of it more as a glucose-lowering drug or a drug to treat obesity? What's your sense of it? Well, I don't want to hedge on this, but I think both, actually, because if we, if we look at the proportion of patients achieving glycemic targets, in these trials, we saw in some of the studies up to 50% of patients actually achieving normal hemoglobin A1C or less than 5.7%. And, you know, 85 to over 90% getting to the general target of less than 7%. And at the same time, a very large proportion of the patients achieving substantial and clinically relevant weight reduction. So I really see it as, as both. And perhaps the distinction I would make is that we, we, we do have a wide spectrum of doses. You know, the starting dose is 2.5 milligrams, but we can use the 5, 7.5, 10, 12.5, and 15. And many of my patients with type 2 diabetes actually do very well with lower doses. They get the weight loss that they need. They get the glycemic control they need. And there's definitely a dose dependency with respect to the weight loss. So I think for obesity or weight loss, we may need the higher doses. So for that reason, I, I actually see it as, as a very good medication that can, that can tackle both of these important issues. So two practical points. If somebody comes to you on a, mass, a maximal dose of semaglutide, whatever that is for them, how do you transition them to terzepatide? Yeah, so what the, the label would tell us would be that we should always start terzepatide at the starting dose, which is 2.5 milligrams once weekly. I will say one thing, in the, the clinical trials, for example, SURPASS-2, which I was the principal investigator of, during the initial four weeks of the study, 
patients went from an A1C on average of 8.3% to 7.5%. So there was a 0.8% reduction in hemoglobin A1C with the 2.5 milligram dose and over 1% reduction when everyone was on the 5 milligram dose. So even the lower doses have very good efficacy. Now that's what the label would say and, and this transition from a GLP-1 receptor agonist to terzepatide has not been assessed in a clinical trial. But I think from a practical perspective, if someone is on two milligrams of semaglutide or three or 4.5 milligrams of dulaglutide, and they've tolerated the GLP-1 receptor agonist well, and they didn't have issues dose escalating the GLP-1 receptor agonist, that I feel comfortable starting with five milligrams once a week of terzepatide. I wouldn't start higher than that, but, um, but I think the five milligram dose would be okay. But for, also from a practical perspective, we get sampled the 2.5 milligram dose, and it's much easier to send the patient out with a sample as well. So they're going to get some improvement, and I don't think they're going to have huge deterioration, and we can okay. just escalate them. Now, another practical question, and you can hear that it slightly annoys me. How do you arrange to every month get a new dose of the terzepatide pen? Because I can't write for four different doses on one prescription. How do you organize this process? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And generally, I mean, we, we happen to have a pharmacy in our medical building oh. that we can write the prescription and they just take it down and get it filled. And it, it's fairly simple for us to be communicating. And most of our patients happen to use that pharmacy. Um, <clears throat> a lot of our patients are uninsured or underinsured, so may not have access. So I must say, although I've studied the drug extensively in the clinical development program, I don't prescribe it as much as I'd like to, just because many patients don't have access to it, as with the GLP-1 receptor agonist. But when I do, I have the luxury of having a pharmacy downstairs that we work with very closely. Otherwise, I think, you know, with electronic medical records, I mean, that's one, one way to do it, or to have someone, if you have a very large volume, it would be to have someone that's sort of assigned to that and, and having to, to, you know, call in the prescriptions or, or make sure that the patient gets them in some way. See, this is just a practical point, but when it happens for me all the time is that the pharmacist asks me through the electronic medical record for a refill, and it's always the last dose. And I actually have to remember that for most people, I have to say, no, 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 I don't want that dose, I want yeah, this dose. The dose. And right. then if I by mistake did the wrong dose, then I have to fix it all. And some patients are having some GI side effects, so I wait for another month, and then I have to, you know, deal with all that. But I do start out by just giving zero, zero refills on each dose string, so at least the pharmacy has to connect with me to get more. Right, right. But I just, it's something to really keep in your mind that this isn't just to check the box, get this same dose strength, it's always to keep going up. And patients may or may not remind you, and you know, as you well know, the more chatter you get in the background of your existence, the harder it is, so. No, I think absolutely, and it, and it does take, I mean, to get to the 15 milligram dose, even if you went as fast as you can, which is escalating in 2.5 milligram increments every four weeks, that's 20 weeks to get to that maximal dose. So it is a lot of sort of hand-holding, if you will, to get to the maximal dose, which not all patients will need, but it, you know, it's a very important practical point. I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. But the other thing is to always set expectations. So I have these patients, they're so anxious to get on it, we do the prior off, they just think they're gonna magically lose all this weight and their A1C is gonna plummet, and it's like, no, 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 this is a process. Yeah. And we will get you there, but if we go too fast, you could get sick. So I do think it's been important for me, at least, to try to make it clear that we're gonna, it's a journey. We're going to go on the terzepatide journey and we're going to get you there. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And they, they will more than likely, based on the data, they'll see improvements as they're going through this yes. escalation journey. But to see possibly the results that they're expecting and that we want to see, it may take some time. And you're, you're absolutely right. In the, in the phase two study that we published in 2018, we got to the 15 milligram dose in six weeks. 
and um, it was not very well tolerated. No, 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 so, that was too fast. Yeah, that, yeah. And then that we, data was like, whoa, what exactly. were they doing? Exactly, and then we did another study to look specifically at slower and more gradual escalation. It was tolerated very well, and then this current sort of methodology of dose escalation came from those studies and was, was used in the, in the phase three trial. So going slow is definitely the way to go to, to mitigate the GI side effects. Now I have two more questions. So while we were talking before we did this recording, you mentioned about a concern about women who were on birth control pills needing to use some other form of contraception when they were dose escalating on this. Can you just explain this and, and what you think that means to patients? Yeah, absolutely. So with the GLP-1 receptor agonists as a class, there is slowing of gastric emptying. Now GLP-1 and not GIP receptor agonism slows gastric emptying. And with the long-acting GLP-1 receptor agonists like liraglutide, dulaglutide, semaglutide, there is a tachyphylaxis or basically a return to normal or to baseline gastric emptying after some time. So in the terzepatide label, there is a, a recommendation that for women of childbearing potential that are on oral contraceptives, that during therapeutic initiation, so when they start therapy or during the four week period after any dose escalation, when there may be some temporary slowing of gastric emptying, that if they're on oral contraceptive, they switch to a non-oral contraceptive method or that they use a barrier method. And that's because the trial or the, the study that was done looking at oral contraceptive blood concentrations after a single tercepatide dose showed that there was a reduction in the maximal concentration, a shift in the time to the maximal concentration, and slightly lower sort of overall um, oral contraceptive concentration in the bloodstream after a single dose. Um, the, after time, though, of use of the medication, gastric emptying normalizes in the pharmacokinetics as well as the pharmacodynamics of the oral contraceptive, so their efficacy should return to normal. So I think it's, a, it's just being very cautious about making sure the women who are using the medication do not become pregnant and have potential issues. It's good to be safe. Yeah, I would agree. Now, my last question is the notion of using this in patients with known cardiovascular disease because it doesn't yet have data from a cardiovascular outcomes trial. Do you differentiate between patients with known cardiovascular disease and those without in terms of how you use this? Yeah, I, I do. I think that, that's, that's critically important. So I, I follow the, the evidence-based guidelines. So, you know, as you know, some of the GLP-1 receptor agonists, so liraglutide, dulaglutide, um, semaglutide, have cardiovascular benefits in patients with established cardiovascular disease, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, or very high-risk patients. Um, terzepatide at this point, it's undergoing a long-term cardiovascular outcomes trial called SURPASS um, CVOT. Um, my understanding is that data will be available in 2024. In the meantime, though, there are cardiovascular safety data. So it has been shown in a meta-analysis of seven clinical trials, as well as a trial called um, SURPASS-4, that it is safe from a cardiovascular perspective. So when it comes to someone with pre-established or known atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, I think I would go towards a GLP-1 receptor agonist with known proven cardiovascular benefit. The other option, though, would be to use a medication that is safe from a cardiovascular perspective and then use an SGLT2 inhibitor with known cardiovascular benefit, so whether it's dapagliflozin or empagliflozin. And then I think it's okay, particularly in a patient who really needs to lose more body weight. So I think we need to individualize, but I do take that into consideration. That was a very good point and one that I was going to bring up, but you beat me to the punchline. So I think it's the, the more agents that we combine with benefit and then the consideration that weight loss itself provides benefit. So right, it's all right. about a balance and certainly the safety signal really matters. So I think we're out of time, but is there any last kind of comments or tips you'd like to give? 
No, I think the one comment I would make is, I mean, we've, we've sort of come a long way in diabetes management in the last 20 years, and, and today with the medications that we have, we're able to really manage in type 2 diabetes one of the re root causes of many issues and that is overweight and obesity so not only are we improving glycemic control by lowering body weight and maintaining that lower body weight but also cardiovascular risk factors biomechanical issues and psychological issues of overweight and obesity so I think you know my message would be if patients have access to these medications we should not wait we should treat patients you know aggressively, safely, but aggressively, and get the best possible glycemic control. Because as you know, you know with, even with the recent evidence from UK PDS showing that after 44 years of follow-up, this legacy effect, this metabolic memory of early good control is still there. And I think that really speaks to the importance of early good control and using the medications that we have in a, in a wise and rational manner. I completely agree, and obviously, ideally, we'd prevent overweight and obesity in the first place, and I think positioning this kind of agent earlier might actually really help prevent that progression because you and I also see patients who have very high BMIs where even losing the kind of weight you'd get with this agent isn't enough to get them to where you really want them to be. So earlier intervention, UKPDS, that was pretty impressive. That was. Wow. Frightening that I was there when they presented the first data set for UKPDS, <laughs> but we won't go there. We have come a long way. <laughs> yeah, a really long way. Anyway, thank you very much for your attention.